Hello, hello. I hope your day's been swell. In this third episode of Let's World Build, I want to hopefully, you know, round out the magic system and all of this stuff and then move into the galaxy creation and what the galaxy is going to look like, which should hopefully be pretty short. I foresee the first half of this episode being rounding out and sort of fixing this this color magic system and then the second half being all about the the galaxy which i foresee most of that being dedicated to explaining the template itself because you know there's not really a huge amount that i that i foresee with with planning the galaxy galaxies are pretty basic a lot of times First, I want to uh, let me grab this over, this notes document over. So between episodes and while I was even editing the the previous episode, I realized that there were some things that I wanted to rework and some problems because, you know, as with everything, the first time you go through something, it's never going to be perfect. So having another look back on it is always good. A couple of smaller things first here. Well, actually, <laughs> this might be worth doing first because it's really fast. So if we go in here, where is it? It's down here. I use a square meter and then like literally two lines later, I use square centimeter. I mean, that should probably be standardized somehow you know made the same i mean in this case let's just i'm just going to change that to centimeters squared because then it lines up with this and i do want it to be where like absorbing a small amount of color you know uses a lot of energy so you know there's that and then there's also the release system and this is something that i was thinking about and i was like like i originally wanted it to be this way but then when i was recording the episode i forgot about that for some reason and then i thought of a completely different system what i came up with in the end was this system where when you're releasing the color energy it flashes on your skin as like a glow and then fades away originally what i was thinking is this So in the process of writing down my original thoughts, I actually came up with, with a few other things, so I'll just read these out. There are two ways of releasing color G, neither of which are the original, or the, the, the way that I said in the last episode. This is the idea that I thought of originally, originally, so even before last episode. Um, putting it on the surface of an object in the form of color again. So if you have red color G stored within yourself, then you can release it by sort of like painting it on the surface of another object. And then that turns that object wherever you painted red. And in this case, colors stack such that if the object was purple and then red is put over it, uh, once the red is absorbed again, the object becomes purple again. In that way, like the original color does not get erased. I might retcon this later because I'm still unsure if I if I want it, but for now this seems fine. Tell me your thoughts about it in, in the comments. As with, you know, everything else that I type here, please be putting your critiques and ideas in the comments. I, I would really love to read those. Storing within an object um, is another option. I had typed this above in, in here. I deleted the bullet point because it's, you know, it's, it's here now. This would make the object glow that color and does not affect the surface color. You can absorb color G out of the object and you can also absorb the color itself. And this way you can have a really powerful magical object because you can only have a limited amount of color on the surface because there's, there's only so much surface area. But this way you can basically put feasibly infinite amount of color G into an object and it just makes it really cold but it's still like you can do that and here's an interesting thought which is what if the object is broken if the object is then broken the color G is and do I want it to be destroyed or stored in the shards that's the question that I'm grappling with right now 
I think it being stored in the shards makes more sense because it preserves uh, conservation of energy. You know, energy can't just be destroyed wholesale just because the object is broken. I think that makes sense. That is those two figured out. So I can get rid of those. And now this. This is the the, the big one here um, that'll take some time. So what I realized was that emotion abilities don't really make much sense for like worms and other lower intelligence beings. Because like how uh, worms don't really have memory or I don't really think they do. Um, and they also wouldn't really have any use for <laughs> creating new memories. And as for like the, the second sentence or third sentence uh, as for this sentence i i decided that i wanted to keep it so that non-intelligent beings can still use this magic what well, what i've coagulated on is that i want these more complex mixes to be for like intelligent beings can use these and then these just like primary colors are very basic like physical things that enhance how the like the physical body works and stuff like that like emotion doesn't really have a place here anymore as it, as you know memory also doesn't so i'm actually just going to move those heightened emotion can be green and this is fairly arbitrary it doesn't really matter actually i'm sort of thinking that purple can be the memory one my reasoning for this is basically nothing because it, i don't know it's just a vibe i just feel like purple feels more memory -y. and i'm thinking even though it's a pretty powerful thing i want slowing aging to be in the more basic ones and i also forgot to put a caveat for this one and this caveat would basically neutralize this anyways what i'm thinking is that red slows aging but it makes you weaker so you'll be able to live for longer, but your quality of life wouldn't be especially good since if you have a lot of red in you, then you wouldn't even really be able to walk very well, which is not the funnest thing in the world. So it's a, it's a trade between quality of life and how long you're living. And so really, I just need to think of two more colors. The reason why I'm settling on only two more colors and one more combination or one more mix is because, well, functionally, it has to stop somewhere. Because if you're saying that if you mix two colors, then it makes like a brand new ability and you're able to keep doing this into infinity, then you're going to have an infinite number of abilities, which is just functionally not really useful. And it would be obviously really hard to think of. So what I'm thinking is that this base number of like six abilities, that's already a pretty good amount of abilities in my opinion. And of course, I can retcon this later or if y'all think that I should do something else. I think this is this is pretty good and it's it's also just efficient for time because otherwise I would be doing magic for like five episodes. And I do legitimately want to move on to the actual like world creation part because admittedly, that's one of my more favorite parts of this. Let me just edit this phrase a bit. So any further combinations only weaken the effects. So like a slightly blue purple doesn't create a new ability. It just makes purple weaker, which would functionally mean that you would be able to put not as much into memory and it obviously like the cost would be less in effect i am reducing the number of mixes down to this just these six near perfect mixes have like a really really weak conglomeration of the two abilities so like the midpoint between purple and blue would just have really really weak memory and oh, whatever blue is going to be abilities that wasn't a good example but you get what I mean. So near perfect mixes aren't really that useful in this universe then, which I am fine with. Now I just need to think of two more abilities. So I'm going to go and brainstorm for blue. So what I've thought of is that blue increases durability, but makes it harder to move. You know, turtles can't really move that fast, but they're pretty dang durable, so I think that makes sense. And so these are the three, like, physical attributes that you can do. You can absorb different amounts of each of these colors separately 
to mix the abilities. And because of this, the most effect that you would get out of absorbing a color is when that color is like the purest yellow or the purest blue and the most saturated. Which actually makes me think that saturation should also be mentioned somewhere because if you have a gray thing that's very slightly red, you're obviously going to get less effect from that. So I'm going to put it right here. I think this is this is fair. Saturation also determines how much color G is gained from absorbing a color. So one standard unit up here corresponds to a hundred percent saturation. So this corresponds to a hundred percent saturation as well. So the less saturation there is, the less energy it takes to absorb, sort of thing, as like a direct relationship. Alrighty, uh, and now. I just have one more color left to think of, to brainstorm up, so I'm gonna do that now. So this took a little bit of time to think of, but I finally got around to it. Orange allows for astral projection, which if you're not sure what that is, it is that the mind can leave the body and observe things potentially very far away, and I want it so that the more orange that you have absorbed, the farther away that one can go from their body. And in fact, I should specify that. Um, this state is optional, which is actually very... This might actually be the only one that can do... Or no, this one is also optional. So unlike these, which take effect the moment that you absorb the color, this one, once you absorb it, you don't have to constantly be in a state of astral projection. You can choose when to like switch it on and off sort of thing. But the cold from having the color energy inside of you is always present. So at the cost of always being ready to do this, your body's going to be colder. And also the, the caveat is sort of like a I mean, it, it goes along with astral projection in general, which is that when it's active, the physical body is helpless and vulnerable. So whenever you're astral projecting, someone can just walk over to you and just like stab you with a knife and that's it. So you have to be careful with this. You have to make sure that you're in a safe spot. And I want to clarify here that this ability is also optional. So. When you have purple absorbed, you aren't just constantly making more memories at a higher rate or something like that. It's something that you have to consciously decide to do, which is also partially why these two things are specifically only usable by intelligent beings. So yeah, you know, they have to put that conscious effort into doing them. I also want to add something to purple, which is that... So, which memory is destroyed is determined by random chance, though the memories slash knowledge that are the least used are more likely to be chosen. So if you don't use this ability very often, then there might not be that much of a drawback to it, so, you know, maybe you forget, like, song lyric. But if you use this a lot, just like Law of Large Numbers, it will rewrite your memories sort of thing. So you have to be careful with this. The The randomness makes it so that you can't choose which memories to discard. And it's also not just a flat whichever memory is the least used because then all of the non-important stuff is going to be discarded, which sort of makes the ability or makes the drawback moot. And I also might change this conversion rate, but we'll see. And yeah, I mean, this rounds out color energy pretty well. I mean, all the rest of this stuff can't really get to yet, since there are no intelligent beings to have it. So, Kalia, it's time to get into something new. Oh boy, let's go. I gotta get to the first notable place that I'm going to add in this universe, which is a galaxy. Here's the first problem that I, that I come to which is that I don't know what to name this galaxy, uh, um, but I also don't just want to name it Galaxy K or something like that. So I'm going to come up with a temporary name for now. I don't know, the main galaxy. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I don't know what else to name this thing. So I'm just going to create that. I want to open it in a new tab because that's easier. 
I'm just going to drag this up to where it needs to go, which is right there. So here we have the main galaxy. I'm just going to grab... Uh, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I'm just going to grab this galaxy template, copy all of that, all of that good stuff, paste it in here, edit these tags a bit. And while I don't have a name for this galaxy yet, I'm just going to wait to put the tag that has the galaxy's name on it, um, since it's obviously not going to be forever called the main galaxy. This is, in fact, the main galaxy of Universe K. That's a very straightforward thing. And before I actually get into any of this stuff, I want to first show y'all, like, a, a, what I'm going for. I have a very specific galaxy shape in mind. So, I'm just going to find an image for this real quick. Alright, so let's see. This style of spiral galaxy looks pretty cool, but it's not specifically what I want to make here. This galaxy. This is called the Sombrero Galaxy. I think it looks really cool. Because it's literally just like a ring of dust and, and gas. And then there's this halo of a cloud of stars. I think this looks really cool. And that's what I want to make my galaxy to be. So yeah, um, I hope that that gives you a good idea of what I'm going for here. So let's get into it. General section is pretty basic for now. Since a lot of this stuff can't be filled out yet. Just like always, I guess. Um, its location is obviously Universe K. And actually, I do want to specify a bit. Specifically, in the smallest galactic supercluster. That is for no particular reason. I just think it feels kind of cool. Which, as you'll, you've probably already discovered, that I do this a lot. Where I don't really have a specific reason for a lot of the details that I put in here. But it just whatever feels right in the moment. And I think this feels right. You know, there's obviously not a name for that yet. So, the appearance. This one's pretty easy since I already showed it to you. Very similar to the Sombrero Galaxy with a large ring of dust and gas clouds surrounded by a spherical haze of stars. Which, I think that's pretty straightforward. That's just a very general statement of the appearance. So the stats portion is very straightforward and... I actually want to get, where is it? I want to get the Milky Way up as a reference, uh, so, just so that we can get a, a taste of what the stats are for our own galaxy, so then, then I can play around with this new galaxy. And actually, alongside this Milky Way reference, so I want to have the actual Sombrero Galaxy here as a reference while I'm creating this. So, let's just start going through the stats here. Age is obvious, type is obvious, and actually I can fill this out real quick because as you can see here it says that the Sombrero Galaxy has unclear classification. From doing a little bit of research on this galaxy, I, it becomes very clear that this thing, scientists don't really know what's happening with this thing. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it has unclear classification, people don't know why it's this shape really very unusual and so the type is unclear it's very unclear to us what what it even is the shape is basically the same as as the appearance the shape is a dark ring surrounded by a spherical haze of light sort of spherical this image makes it more like a what's the 3d version of an ellipsoid but i mean you you understand it's sort of like egg shaped in a way the dimensions, I'm going to have to fiddle around a bit. I think height, height would still apply. Radius, I'm going to add that this is the ring radius, so the radius of this, since it sort of looks like that's sort of like the, the boundary of this thing. Its diameter is 49,000 light years. So it is smaller than the Milky Way. Um, and if you see here, or the radius itself of the Milky Way is already 48,000. So this thing is a good bit smaller, or this thing is. I do want to sort of make this in between those two, so I'm gonna say the ring radius could be like, here's a semi-random number, 3,000 light years. I think that's pretty fair. 
And just looking at this image, it seems as though the, like, from top to bottom of the haze is about three-fourths the radius, if I were to eyeball that. And, you know, th this doesn't really need to be exact at this, at this stage. I, I don't see myself going into the specific, or needing to go into the specific details of the galaxy, because the creatures on this planet that I'm going to create won't be exploring space for a long time so what is eight times three that's like twenty-four thousand. i'll make it twenty-five thousand light years tall so that's not like here all the way to here that's from the center to here Ooh, i'm actually just going to leave volume blank and thus i'm going to leave density blank mass how did i deal with mass here oh well that's a lot of solar masses i'm going to say on the order of around 10 to the 11th solar masses, which I'm just using this value here, since our Milky Way is around on the order of 10 to the 12th. You know, if you change the radius of something, then the volume will change by cube of that. And also, you know, you have this extra material up, you know, on the top and bottom, so I think that's a fair estimate. I'm very much not an expert in galaxies, so I'm just sort of winging it. Motion. There are a lot of <laughs> bullet points on this one, and that's because motion can be a very complex thing. Overall motion, this is where the galaxy, like, is the galaxy moving to a specific spot in the universe? Is it tending towards somewhere? Where is it going? This galaxy is moving towards another larger galaxy and will collide with it in around a billion years. I'm copying real life with this with our own Milky Way galaxy, which is set to collide with Andromeda in... I actually don't know how long, I think it's on the order of a few billion years, but... In a billion years from the start of multicellular life, the galaxy will collide with the larger galaxy. And I think that might lead to a really, really cool visual where whenever intelligence evolves on this planet, it'll be able to look up at the stars and see a really dazzling display of two galaxies colliding right in front of them. And it could also create some interesting situations where life is being disrupted because of this collision. Rotational period. Okay, so it looks like there's no reference to rotational period here. For the Milky Way, it is around two to three hundred million years. I am not at all knowledgeable about this, and I'll have to do a bit more research, but I'll leave that blank for now. There is no parent orbital body. This is a large enough galaxy that it's not orbiting around another galaxy. And so all of this, all of this orbital stuff is gone. There's no need for it. Satellites. Is there anything that's, like, are there any smaller galaxies that are orbiting this one? I'll say, since this is a fairly sized galaxy, as you can see, the Milky Way has a lot of smaller galaxies that are orbiting it. So I think it's reasonable that a galaxy that's around, like, half the size of the Milky Way would have five smaller galaxies orbiting this one. And I'm not going to delve any further into that. Actually, I'm going to research this a bit, and I will get right back to you in a moment. Okay, so what I found in general is that galaxy rotation is a very weird thing. I'm still going to keep that blank, even after I've, I've done a bit of research. It just doesn't really seem like we know enough for me to be able to extrapolate this or at least with the very cursory look that i did maybe there are some scientific papers that that explain this a lot better but this is where i'm at right now so i'm going to move on to stellar composition and this is an interesting thing and it's basically a question of do i want there to be generally newer stars or generally older stars i think wait these two are switched it should be newer bluer stars yeah it should be this way around so if you have a lot of new star creation your galaxy is going to look a lot bluer and if you have older stars then it's going to look redder 
gonna create a, a new section here. So I'm going to say that there's a general tendency to have older stars in this galaxy. And that's just because like with the actual Sombrero Galaxy, as you can see, it's not especially blue. I read in this part that the nucleus itself isn't really creating a lot of new stars, which will not lead to very many young stars. And I don't know if that can be extrapolated to the entire galaxy, but... And I think that the core of a galaxy typically has more star formation than the rest of the galaxy, since there's more activity going on there, stuff like that. But again, I'm not an astronomer, that's just from my limited knowledge. So with a general tendency for older stars, older stars are very typically red and white dwarfs. And you can even see this with our own galaxy, which is that you have 10 billion white dwarfs in our galaxy and probably a similar amount of red dwarfs because red dwarfs also last a really long time. Uh, and then I want there to be much smaller numbers of main sequence and giant stars. And this is something that you see in the Milky Way as well, where there are tons and tons of red and white dwarfs, um, especially in the region that the Earth is in. These stars are just a lot more visible because they're bigger and they, you know, they have much, much bigger luminosities than these smaller ones. So even though you see less of these, they are very numerous. By main sequence, this is basically just the type of star that the sun is. A lot of times it's described as like the, the middle age of stars. It's the very typical, very stable evolutionary stage of a star. The sun's been in it for a while and will be in it for another while until it dies. Giant stars are typically the end of a star's life cycle when it inflates into a giant star and then either explodes into a supernova or they just fizzle out and die slowly over time and become red dwarfs so that's fun and let's actually add that there also exists some neutron stars neutron stars are basically like white dwarfs except they're even more massive and almost paradoxically smaller than white dwarfs it's kind of complicated just know that they're very weird and very cool. Um, so, number of stars. This is another thing where I'm not sure if I will be able to really answer this. So in the Milky Way, there are 100 to 400 billion stars total. I'm only going to use orders. So I would say like on the order of 10 to the 10 stars, maybe. This is just a very rough guess. And actually, I'm going to include 10 to the 11 as well. And then stellar regions. I'm basically just going to copy this portion from the Milky Way portion. So older stars away from the center and newer stars closer to the center. And that's really all that you need to know about the regions in this galaxy since it's, as you can see, there's no clear regions to be had here. Absolute brightness is the standard brightness that an object is, no matter what distance you're, you're viewing it from. Like, the sun seems really bright, but its absolute brightness is a lot, lot smaller than something like the giant star Rigel. Even though, obviously, in the night sky, Rigel looks a lot dimmer than the sun is, but it's because the sun is a lot closer. You know, it's not really useful for this galaxy because we're not going to be observing it from other galaxies. And then this magic portion is for if magic is integral to, like, the galaxy itself, which in this case it is not since magic is really only usable, well, magic is only usable by living organisms, and so there's not going to be any significant contribution from magic to the galaxy itself so i'm i'm just going to delete that and then so this other stuff i have explained except in other pages so there's not really any need to go into those now so this actually rounds out my creation of this galaxy it was very short and sweet and that's because the greater galaxy itself does not really play into the you know the the specifics of the solar system and the planet itself so i am going to leave it at that 
and I will see y'all in the next episode where I'm going to start with the star itself, the star of this solar system. But before the video ends, here is a little look from Reliol. Though the universe held many planets with life, I shall only focus on one for now. It lay in a galaxy much unlike your own. Rather than spirals, stars flew in an amorphous haze around the center, with only a thick ring of gas and dust to keep them company. Shining yellows, oranges, and reds orbited forever unorganized around the central black hole, like moths around a light. They burned deep into old age, though not terribly brightly.